Hi out there, everybody in the 413. We're here with another week of SSO Homegrown, and this week we have the assistant principal base of the Springfield Symphony with us, Mr. Alex Fenson. Oh, Alex, can you call yourself up there on the uh, Zoom machine? Why, there you are, Alex. How you doing? Doing well. How about you? Fantastic. Now, where are we Zooming to you from today? So where are you, in other words? So I'm Zooming from Madison, Connecticut, from my home studio, as you can see my instruments in the background. Um, so uh, Madison's uh, down on the shoreline in Connecticut. All right. And so now, where are you from originally? Originally, I'm from uh, Western New York. So I grew up in a small town called Jamestown, New York. Our claim to fame is uh, that we're the hometown of Lucille Ball. Oh, wow. Well, that's, that's kind of cool in a way. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And now, you know, it's this whole big thing. It's now the home of the National Comedy Center. Um, so there's a big museum. There are two, I think they run two uh, Lucille Ball festivals. Um, oh, one is Lucy Desi Days. And so it's a, it's, a big, uh, it's a big tourism attraction for the area. And it's really been a boon for the town. Well, fun. I, I, I love, uh, who doesn't love Lucy? I love Lucy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, well, let's hear about you in that hometown. How did you start playing music? Did you come from a musical family or did, was it in school? I did. So my, my family was very musical. My mom is a trumpeter and a church organist. Um, my parents were both heavily involved in musical theater. Um, so both on stage, acting, dancing, singing. Oh, great. Um, and my mom more so, uh, more often in the pit orchestra. And so oh, I, got, uh, I, I got kind of, um, you know, a, a very early musical exposure. And I, I, you know, we were so lucky, had a bunch of instruments in the house. And I, I learned to play piano pretty young. Um, but for the most part, I credit my um, early upbringing with, you know, of course, that musical exposure, but with the public school experience. I started singing, you know, in, in general music in elementary school, started playing recorder uh, in middle school. I joined the band, orchestra, and chorus, and I kind of ran the gamut of instruments before I settled on the double bass. Um, so I, uh, I, I think my first instrument really was piano. Mm -hmm. I started taking guitar lessons and was kind of fumbling around on the guitar and I had big kind of awkward hands and <laughs> my guitar teacher said, uh, have you ever thought about the bass? And my dad had played the bass when he was younger and so we had an electric bass at home. Uh, and I, I said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And meanwhile, I was playing saxophone and, and viola and cello in school. Um, so I kind of, like I said, I ran the gamut of instruments. Um, and I didn't start the double bass until my freshman year of high school. All right. Wow. And then by the time, now, where did you go to undergrad? Where'd you go to college, university? Uh, SUNY Fredonia, which is- And so uh, by the time you went there, were you, uh, were you already going there as a double bass major? I was, yeah. Yep. So in those four years of high school, you went from really kind of just getting a little bit serious with the instrument to making that your, your major, your, your raison d'etre, so to speak. Yeah, I actually, there's a funny story about my uh, choosing to go to music school. Uh, at the time, my senior year, I was auditioning and deciding to audition for, for music school. I kind of knew that I wanted to do music as a profession, but I wasn't sure exactly how. And I was pretty good at the double bass, and I was also pretty good at the tuba, and uh, wow. probably equally good at the tuba, which is a great double. There are a lot of musicals, you know, that call for tuba and bass, and they're very well related. Um, the, original, the original orchestration of Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue actually has it in mind that the bass player should also play tuba, or vice versa, but that it should be one person. Just a little, little tidbit of information for you. Yeah, I played that, uh, that edition uh, last year with a group, and that, that was really fun. But I, I was, it was kind of weird because I was only working half the time. I didn't actually double, so there was another tuba player. And uh, I was playing half the time, and the tuba player is playing half the time, and you know, the, basically the entire finale is all tuba. So right. I, well, when, when I usually, if I have two people playing that version, that Paul Whiteman original version of it, I, I, I pretty much just have them double each other the whole time, uh, be, the way it would be in the full orchestra, you know, since you got two people. But it would be really fun. I've always dreamt of doing that with one guy who would play the bass, do, 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 stick that down and pick up the tuba and start boom, 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 uh, you know, a little... <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. Okay, enough of that. Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the piece that we're going to hear today. This is a performance you made there in your studio uh, of an incredibly, or rather music by an incredibly important composer for the double bass, uh, Mr. Dragonetti. Uh, mm -hmm. What can you quickly tell us about him, other than the fact he was Italian and spent a lot of his career in England and lived to be really old? Uh, but he did really important stuff for the double bass and was a virtuoso himself. Tell us a little bit about him. He did, yeah. So um, he lived in a really pivotal time in the instrument's development. So, you know, the, the double bass uh, had kind of grown out of these two families of instruments, the violin family and the gamba family. And you can kind of see influences of both instruments. Um, uh, and so Dragon Eddy was really the first double bassist, as, as kind of as we know the instrument today. Mm -hmm or very similar anyway, um, to be a virtuoso player on the instrument. Before it had been, you know, it had been really an accompaniment instrument and he brought it up into the, to the forefront of music, uh, a lot of which by just playing the music of other instruments, uh, which is uh, okay. still, still very common today. But, uh, but so he elaborated on the repertoire. He wrote all these wonderful pieces. He wrote a, a very challenging set of studies. Um, that are still, you know, very good to, to work on today. Now, now, speaking of the bass playing music originally written for another instrument, am, am I crazy in imagining that I have heard you play a Bach suite for cello on the double bass? Yep, yep, that's a very common uh, kind of milestone in uh, double bass players' development is learning some Bach. And it's very gratifying that we can do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, tell us a, a little bit specifically about the pieces that we're going to hear right now. So these pieces, uh, so uh, they were discovered after his death among his papers. Uh, and I'm playing today uh, two of 12 waltzes for the double bass um, that he wrote. And uh, it's probably, he never, we know, we never, he never played them on concert, but he may have played them in his salon for friends. Um, and I think uh, they were probably written later in his life. All right. He played in his salon for friends. Well, that's kind of exactly what we're going to experience right now, uh, because you played those in your own salon. And since we're out here in the internet virtual world, everybody is our friend. So we're going to get kind of a touch back to uh, several hundred years ago. You in your salon playing Dragonetti for friends. Let's have a listen to that. So today I'll play for you two waltzes of a set of 12 waltzes for the double bass by Domenico Dragonetti. These are valse number one and valse number two. Dragonetti never performed them in his lifetime, but he may have played them for some friends. Uh, the manuscript for these waltzes were found in his papers after his death. Please enjoy the waltz number one and waltz number two. <laughs> I 
Fragonetti lived around the turn of the 19th century. He was born in 1763 and died in 1846. Um, Fragonetti was a contemporary of Beethoven's and the two met, this uh, being the 250th anniversary year of Beethoven's birth. I thought it'd be fun to share the story of their meeting. So Domenico Dragonetti and Beethoven were both famous during their time, and they both knew of each other. And in 1799, Domenico Dragonetti decided to call on Beethoven in Vienna. Uh, Dragonetti traveled to Vienna, and the, the two, Beethoven and Dragonetti, met and discussed the double bass. Uh, Beethoven had heard, of course, of Dragonetti's uh, prowess as a virtuoso double bassist, and also had heard that he performed music of other instruments, including the violin cello. Um, so the two decided to call on the double bass, have the double bass brought over, and they performed together uh, the uh, Beethoven Cello Sonata Number no. 2, Opus 5. And it said that Beethoven, while accompanying, uh, had his eyes immovably fixed on Dragonetti and his double bass, and was so struck by the virtuosity of the final movement that as soon as they finished playing, Beethoven leapt out of his seat and embraced both the performer and the instrument. And of course, Dragonetti's influence is evident in Beethoven's future writing, um, especially in Beethoven's Symphony No. 5 that came out uh, several years later after they met. Um, it said that Dragonetti really influenced Beethoven's concept of the double bass as a virtuoso and orchestral instrument and its uh, capabilities, and you can really hear it in the symphonies five through nine. <laughs> and thank you for supporting the Springfield Symphony Orchestra. Wow, wasn't that great hearing the double bass be so lively and athletic instead of just boom, 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 what you usually expect for a bass. Uh, oh my gosh, Alex, you're a virtuoso, but I already knew that. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> And, and another thing I have to tell everyone about, uh, Alex and I, we, we don't just bond on music. Uh, we also bond in that we are both extraordinarily avid fans of sci-fi. And a few years ago, when we did a concert with music from uh, Star Wars, uh, Alex, I asked him, we got to talking, and he was telling me, oh, I have a couple little things I could bring. Because I had said, hey, if anybody has costume or props or anything like that, bring them and we'll see what we do in the concert. So you came in full Jedi gear with lightsaber and played the electric bass on the cantina band from the original film, right? I did, that was a lot of fun. Oh my gosh, I can't wait till we are playing together. Alex, it's great to see you, it's great to hear you, but man, I wish we were in the same place making music together for all of those wonderful people live out there in Symphony Hall. And uh, 
We miss it so much. Yeah, yeah, it's really incredible. And I just wanna also quick take this opportunity, I'll say it in other videos as well, but I wanna thank everybody who contributed last week to the Giving Tuesday Now event for money for the Musicians Relief Fund. It was an, such an incredible success. Yes, we'll give big applause to everybody out there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex, for today and sharing your art with us. And we'll see everybody next time on SSO Homegrown. Thank you.